we have a fantastically distinguished medalist, Teresa Woodruff. Uh, she's currently the Dean and Associate Provost for Graduate Education at the Graduate School at Northwestern University. She has a whole series of accolades to her name, both in terms of research and in other roles. So just to pull out one or two, um, she, she's the founder and director of the Women's Health Research Institute. She's the director of the Onco Fertility Consortium and she coined the term Onco Fertility around 10 years ago to describe the merging of, of the two fields, oncology and fertility, which are her um, keen interests. She's done a lot outside of her research work, so she founded and directs the Onco Fertility Saturday Academy, which is a high school outreach program engaging girls in basic and medical sciences. And she was awarded the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring by President Obama in 2011. She was named in Times Magazine's Most Influential Persons list, and she's been awarded a whole series of academic uh, recognitions, including a Guggenheim Fellowship this year, the Society for Endocrinology Transatlantic Medal, which we will award today, and a leadership award from the Endocrine Society. She has a number of um, honorary degrees, and she's also a past president of the American Society. So we're very privileged to have Teresa give this uh, lecture today. So welcome. Thank I look you forward so to much. hearing it. Thank you, Karen, and to the Society, thank you so much for this honor. It's really a, a wonderful opportunity to come and see so many friends here, uh, as well as uh, to uh, share in some scientific discourse and, and certainly to celebrate the field of endocrinology, which all of us love. So I uh, have no disclosures for today, but want to immediately get into this topic of fertility management in the cancer setting. And I think many people are aware that um, the fertility threats associated with the off-target effects of chemotherapy and radiation can uh, threaten fertility in those individuals who are in the younger age range. We think of cancer as a disease of aging, and of course it is, uh, but about 10% of the nearly 10 million individuals around the globe who will have a cancer diagnosis this year will be in that age range when both their fertility and their endocrine health can be compromised by that same treatment that will in fact save their lives. And so um, we, over the last several years, have developed a number of options together with people from around the globe, and uh, the, the we is uh, millions of, uh, of um, patients working together, millions, I don't know where that came from. A <laughs> not used to hyperbole, but somehow my brain gave that word, but a lot of people, how about that, uh, working together on uh, fertility management options. Uh, certainly options were available for men, particularly semen banking, but for women with the same hope for surviving their disease, um, there were very few options made available to them. Even though there were mature options like uh, uh, assisted reproductive technologies, uh, we really simply needed to get the fields walk, uh, talking together in order to permit the uh, interventions of hormonal stimulation to allow for the acquisition of embryos, or in fact now eggs. Uh, we had to manage a lot of the expectations of cancer patients for whom these uh, uh, interventions uh, were not uh, available or for whom uh, they did not have time or when there was a, uh, a condition that might medically uh, preclude them from hormonal interventions. And for that, adoption was an important um, uh, intervention that we now have available to many cancer patients. Surrogacy is also an important option because of the potential damage of the chemotherapy or radiation to the uterus or to the cervix. But not all cancer patients will be sterilized by their cancer, and so natural pregnancy is, an, uh, is um, something that uh, may be anticipated in certain uh, conditions. And of course, that also means that unintended pregnancies can occur uh, when young people um, uh, engage in sex. And so making sure that we think about the sexuality component, even in that time frame of uh, an early cancer diagnosis, uh, is an important concept that's part of the 360 of care, 360 of care for the oncofertility patient. Now for um, pediatric and adolescent cancer patients, and again for that few number of adult cancer patients for whom none of these other options are viable, ovarian tissue cryopreservation has emerged as a uh, technology that is providing hope for uh, the future of these patients. 
essentially the ovary, one ovary or a biopsy is removed from a uh, individual highly likely to be sterilized by their uh, treatment. Uh, and then uh, actually as you uh, dissect out that tissue, oocytes can be uh, procured and can be matured and cryopreserved for that patient. In addition, the outer cortex of the ovary can be um, sectioned into regions that contain uh, the high, uh, de highest density of the primordial and primary follicles, those follicles that are the reproductive future for that individual. In the Oncofertility Consortium, 80% of that tissue is transferred for cryo storage for that patient's later use, and 20% are uh, donated to the research that we hope make that other 80% useful in the future. And the good news is that there have been more than 80 live human births from tissue that's been cryopreserved and transplanted back into those cancer patients. This is really good news because it says the way we're cryopreserving the tissue uh, is in fact maintaining the function. And these uh, uh, transplants have been done all around the globe. Sherm Silber in St. Louis, Donay in Belgium, Suzuki in Japan, uh, others in France. Uh, and so I expect that we'll see more of these transplants occurring over time. While that's uh, important, we really don't yet know the efficiency. Um, uh, the entire denominator is not uh, fully recognized. In these high volume centers, um, the, um, uh, the efficiency is about 30%, but there are many sites that have been cryopreserving tissues and transplant, transplanting, and so we don't know the actual efficiency uh, on a global level. In addition, that tissue comes out prior to the first sterilizing treatment, so cancer recurrence is a possibility, leading us to want to develop additional methodologies for uh, managing uh, these tissues. And this is particularly acute for our fertility and endocrine needs of pediatric cancer patients, where you can see within the image from this four-year-old uh, patient from uh, the National Physicians Cooperative, the clinical group of the uh, Oncofertility Consortium, the small resident primordial follicles that are sitting there waiting towards uh, the time that they would be ultimately selected to begin that process of development leading to ovulation. That's the tissue we have stored for this uh, particular patient, but in addition you can see that the green cells represent the cancer that that patient is fighting and in fact would then preclude this tissue uh, from uh, transplant back into the patient because of the high likelihood of reintroduction to disease. So that leads our, to the need for research, and I'm just going to tell you a few short stories about where we are in terms of follicle maturation and the endocrine hormones that are produced by these tissues, uh, ways that we can begin to identify high fidelity oocyte maturation, and uh, work that we're doing towards pubertal transition for these pediatric cancer patients who not only lose that future fertility, but will lo lose the endocrine uh, hormones necessary to transition uh, through puberty. So, of course, follicle culture is something that uh, has been ongoing for many years within the discipline, including many people um, who are uh, here in the UK. Uh, and we could, in fact, take the ovarian structure and uh, take apart the somatic cells and the germ cells and put that onto uh, petri dishes and under the right hormonal conditions, you can reassemble what appears to be a follicle-like structure. Um, and that really has uh, led the way to some of our understanding about some of the signaling pathways associated with granulosa cell uh, function. But that oocyte in the center really never did mature at a high enough rate to really make it a, a viable option for transfer to the human. And in addition, when you take human uh, ovarian tissue and uh, place it into the same conditions, that follicle structure does not develop and the oocyte uh, cannot be uh, maintained. So we imagined uh, that there might be a structural context that was necessary, and the geometry associated with the cells surrounding the, surrounding the oocyte uh, may contribute to the overall uh, dynamic function of the oocyte from the time it's a resting uh, primordial oocyte through the various growth and developmental sequences leading to a fertilizable M2 egg. And so uh, many years ago, I started collaboration with Lonnie Shea, who's a biomedical engineer, and together we imagined how we might develop a uh, infrastructure that could uh, support uh, individual ovarian follicles. And so from those ovarian biopsies from the patients, um, you can see those immature follicles, and we can isolate follicles of all different classes uh, from human, from mouse, and many other species. I'll try to thread out very carefully today where we are with the mouse and where we are with uh, non-human primate and uh, human studies. Uh, Lonnie was the one who identified alginate as a biomaterial that would have the ability to allow for transfer in and out of um, macromolecules. 
Uh, and uh, in fact, this was the uh, material that we've used uh, for the last tech 10 years or so. Stephanie Pangus uh, was the one who first put follicles into these uh, alginate beads. You can see we can isolate the murine follicles at the top in large numbers. These are the two layer secondary follicles with the oocyte not yet beginning the process of, of uh, rapid growth. Uh, and each of those follicles are placed within um, this uh, uh, translucent biomaterial. The follicles then develop uh, the two somatic compartments of the follicle as the granulosa cells expand away from the center oocyte. The outer cells uh, take on the features of theca-like cells. Uh, and this is uh, um, uh, very characteristic of these follicles, and the internal cells take on the granulosa cell phenotype of the inhibin alpha uh, production as well as aromatase. And uh, as the follicles begin to develop these um, two compartments within the in vitro setting, you can see that at the beginning they don't produce appreciable amounts of hormones, but as the two compartments are established, they do now produce uh, the uh, steroid hormones uh, in the absence of exogenous hormones added to the media. The follicles then uh, undergo a uh, morphogenic um, uh, transition where the oocyte moves from the center to an acentric location with the formation of an antrum, uh, and we think this allows for uh, the continual oxygenation of the oocyte in the context of rapid somatic cell development. And then if we add HCG, we can uh, develop an in vitro ovulation um, assay where the oocyte actually ruptures from a singular unique side of the uh, oocyte of the follicle with the expansion of the cumulus cells. And uh, these oocytes, when they are ovulated, are largely in the M2 state, so that terminal uh, state just prior to ovulation. Now, the follicles um, are not fully falling apart. They are uh, actually, just as in vivo, uh, directing a specific um, uh, portion of the outer wall of the uh, follicle to uh, be uh, ruptured as the oocyte moves from the inside to the outside. So we wondered if there was a similar uh, resealing of that uh, outer wall of the follicle in vitro. And in fact, there is. And not only is there the resealing of the ovarian structure into uh, a uh, fully, um, uh, uh, fully um, formed um, structure, it now has uh, features of, luteal, of luteinization. So you can see the hypertrophy of those granulosa cells uh, and these uh, follicle structures now produce uh, progestins. And uh, most importantly, not only do we get the hormones produced, but the oocytes uh, themselves are uh, meiotically competent and can give rise to live, healthy offspring. These are my, the two first uh, born from this uh, encapsulated in vitro follicle growth uh, system, EIVFG, um, and they still are my favorites, and so I show them every time. But we do have other mice that have been born, and we're currently looking at the epigenetics of oocytes uh, matured uh, completely in vitro. When we translate this to human, you can now see a follicle with the human oocyte already moving to one side uh, as it goes through uh, its uh, developmental, uh, uh, developmental pathway. We then obtain uh, a good number of high quality GV eggs. And in fact, last year we showed uh, for the first time four human M2 eggs that have been developed completely in vitro. This was after uh, 40 days in culture, and certainly uh, this uh, represents a milestone in our field that shows you can acquire that level of um, uh, meiotic competence, but we still have to develop better strategies for um, ensuring uh, more, folli more follicles and more oocyte and closed follicles continue to this stage of maturation. So what I've shown you is that we can get follicle maturation from early stages of development, and today I'm not threading out for you the important differences um, in uh, EIVFG for the primordial and primary follicles. Uh, essentially, you have to go to a higher uh, rigidity and group cultures in order for those follicles to go down the same uh, pathway toward development. Um, but we do have um, developmental uh, sequences for uh, each stage of uh, follicular genesis and from uh, multiple species. In addition, we have some of the additional hallmarks of ovulation and luteinization. And so as a consequence, I was really intrigued by the fact that we might be able to develop a system that would allow for us to uh, take advantage of and harness uh, these transitions in uh, the follicle to drive uh, interactions uh, in an in vitro system. And here, this is a, uh, uh, a microfluidic, microdynamic system that we invent invented to allow for the uh, movement of endocrine hormones between a variety of tissues. Uh, and so connectivity here at the, in the title could easily be said to be endocrinology. 
we uh, don't have an endocrine uh, system in vitro that allows us to look at the hormones as they're being made in dynamic time and their downstream effects on uh, tissues like in the reproductive tract, the uh, follicle on fallopian tube, uterus, and the uh, cervix uh, with the liver present for the purpose of uh, metabolism. And so we did invent this system together with Draper Laboratories, an engineering firm that uh, uh, put the um, space shuttle uh, into space. Uh, and so they were true engineers as we developed the uh, methodology to allow for the uh, dynamic culturing of follicles, as you see here, 10 follicles under dynamic uh, flow. Uh, and when we uh, took that microfluidic platform, which we call the SOLO, the single system, uh, we could actually trigger a series of transitions through a uh, follicular phase and then a luteal phase. And in fact, on the x-axis, uh, that is 28 days uh, in culture. It looks like the day moved up a bit. Uh, but that represents the longest durable culture of uh, follicles with the accompanying transition in hormones uh, over time. We then went to the 5 by system, the system we call now the EVATAR, and this includes not only the ovaries, and in fact, uh, due to time, I can't thread out all the different iterations we have on the microfluidic system, but not only do we have follicles, we have whole ovaries. And we can combine that mouse ovary, in this case, all of these uh, systems were done with mouse ovaries or follicles, and then human for the remaining tissues, the fallopian tube, the uh, uh, cervix, uh, and then the liver. And so uh, fluid dynamically flows uh, and recirculates within the system. And so here then is the 28-day cycle uh, on the EVATAR. This again represents just the hormonal cycle of estradiol and progesterone. And now the downstream tissues are in fact consuming uh, the hormones uh, even as they're responding uh, to the uh, tissues in, uh, func in process. Um, and I took out one of the slides, um, but we also then have uh, downstream tissues that are functioning for that full 28 days. And I'm really convinced that this uh, microfluidic system is going to be uh, disruptive to the way we do all of biological science. Because in fact, in the past, we've largely relied on the Petri dish, where there are no endocrine hormones that can flow or dynamically change, as of course we see uh, within the body. Uh, and so the Petri dish also represents a, a setting where we simply are, are studying the biology of metabolic waste. And in the microfluidic system, we have the constant flow, uh, the input of nutrients and the export of waste. And that, to me, represents a brand new way of thinking about um, the uh, ways um, tissues can behave uh, over longer periods of time. And so uh, just as with the follicles, we have um, all the other uh, tissues of the reproductive tract also functioning over this full period of time. And we can now look at the regulation in the follicular phase and the luteal phase. We had a few of these quintets left, and my student asked what we should do, and I said, well, we should make it pregnant. And so once I got him up off the floor, um, I told him it could be hormonally pregnant. Uh, we added uh, into the luteal phase um, the hormones of the, of the uh, embryo to allow for then the question of whether or not luteal function could be maintained over a period of time. And in fact, it can, suggesting that there really is um, a durability to all of the tissues and culture and that they're responding in the idiosyncratic way we would predict based on in vivo biology. So um, this um, system, we think, is going to allow for, uh, in the future, personalized drug testing, where one could imagine IPS cells being derived into a variety of tissues, particularly the liver, to be able to look at the efficacy or toxicity of drugs uh, for an individual. It's going to allow for toxicology testing, particularly in the reproductive tract, where for the female, there are very few pharmaceutical companies that do anything with female reproductive toxicology. And I think this provides for that new inroad. It's going to allow for a new level of signaling pathways and in integrated cell biology. All of our drug uh, development is largely done with, again, single cells in flat plastic. Uh, and that doesn't allow for us to learn how these cells are actually uh, being regulated through homeostatic and, um, and changes uh, within the body. And um, with the microfluidics, this is going to allow for a new dynamism in the way we study uh, cell biology. Uh, it's going to be useful towards contraceptive development. Primarily, we now have an in vitro um, uh, um, uh, ovulation assay, 
uh, which I think will be uh, a great way for us to look at a number of proteases that may be uh, specifically within that rupture zone, and we'll be able to identify those that are efficacious on the function of ovulation without having appreciable effects on the transition between follicular and luteal phase, uh, as well as what their effects are on peripheral tissues. And ultimately, systems like this will help uh, in the reduction of animals in research. Now, um, we also wanted to know from our follicles that we're developing completely in vitro for uh, long periods of time, for example, the human follicle, which takes about 40 days before we get a mature egg, or in the case of the non-human primate work that Dick Stauffer has done at the Oregon National Primate Institute, about 52 days, we wanted to have alternative ways to really interrogate whether or not that egg was of good quality before um, uh, ultimate transfer. And so we've worked on this for a number of years and have a number of um, uh, ways to interrogate the egg, including the, um, uh, the structure of the chromosomes and have shown that in the human there is a change in the cohesion uh, over time and in fact there is a widening of the gap between the chromatids as early as um, uh, the late 20s, which is uh, hearkening uh, an earlier aging of that egg than we had appreciated in the past. And we've looked at the physical structure of individual chromosomes pulled out of the meiotic um, mass and have shown that the physical rigidity of the chromosomes within a meiotic uh, setting is about tenfold more rigid than mitotic, uh, and that with age there is a further uh, uh, ossification or rigidity uh, of, these, uh, of these chromosomes. And while these are terrific studies um, to really understand some of the fundamental biology, of particularly the structure-function relationships, they didn't allow us to know whether or not an egg was of good quality in a non-invasive way. And so um, Tom O'Halloran, uh, who is a professor of chemistry at Northwestern and also serves as my husband, uh, and I um, made the following discovery. And uh, so in this particular case, there's no other way to tell the story other than to say my husband and I were walking along Lake, Shore, uh, Lake Michigan, and he asked me why there was so much sperm, why there was so much zinc in sperm. And I said to him, I don't care. And a few more steps, and his lower lip was trembling since he's an inorganic chemist, and he thought I meant that I didn't care about zinc, but of course I told him I didn't care about sperm. And so uh, we decided to actually, because he had uh, invented a whole toolbox for looking at uh, zinc uh, in uh, biological samples, we looked at the uh, egg, and in fact, um, we were able to demonstrate that from the egg at the time of fertilization, there's a whole series of talks on, on this particular topic, but I'll simply show you here that in fact, at the time of fertilization, there is a release of, um, of uh, 10 billion zinc atoms that represents what we call the zinc spark. Uh, and uh, not only were we able to do this in the mouse, we were able to uh, acquire funding from Farring Pharmaceuticals in the United States who can't activate human eggs uh, the one on the left is uh, not mature, and the two on the right are. And those would be the ones that we would predict to go on and give rise to live, healthy birth. So this represents a new idea in the field of egg biology, where we knew that calcium fluxes were important for initiating the, immediately po the immediate post-fertilization events, but it turns out what calcium is doing is causing a series of zinc fluxes. And because these are in the uh, external environment, um, this will allow for a non-invasive way to test for the quality of individual eggs. And so not only do we have the ability to look at the chromosome number and, of course, the, um, the genes that are expressed, uh, we now also have a way to look at egg quality from an extracellular way. So let me come back in the last two minutes to this uh, last topic of pubertal transition in our pediatric cancer patients and trying to address the specific endocrine needs uh, for this population. Well, um, we really didn't think that individual follicles was going to be uh, the right way to go for these uh, pediatric cancer patients because here we're not trying to provide fertility. We really want durable organ uh, function. And so Monica LaRonda, uh, when she was a postdoc in the lab, took this on and began to look at the um, architecture of the ovary and, in fact, decellularized the ovary. Uh, and in this particular image, this is from the, from the cow, but you can also see uh, the human decellularized tissue here. And from that decellularized tissue, we were able to mill it into an extracellular, uh, what we're calling an ink. 
uh, and that ink has uh, structural integrity that we can use to create what's shown in the left-hand pa panel, which we call the ovary paper. And the ovary paper then can, uh, was uh, kind of our first attempt to develop um, products from the ink that has the actual uh, extracellular matrix signaling uh, for the medulla or for the, for the cortex uh, embedded within that tissue. And then we can put follicles on top of, on that, uh, on that um, uh, paper, and then you can suture it back any place basically in the body. This is um, with an engineer suture, so uh, all of you who are surgeons in the room uh, don't look at the sutures, but essentially uh, for those individuals who no longer have uh, ovarian structures, this provides an opportunity to reduce the number of cancer cells by simply isolating the follicles and transferring them back. That's really not a long-term uh, long goal, but it did allow us to understand a little bit more about the extracellular matrix and its composition and its geometry and the different regions of the ovary. And now we can use that extracellular matrix, uh, in fact, in an extrusion process called 3D printing. And we can study how we can develop different angles and porosity together with different inks from different regions of the tissue to build back what we're calling an ovarian bioprosthetic. So um, from the ovarian uh, tissues, we were able to create what we call an ovarian bioprosthetic with ovarian follicles embedded within it. The follicles grow and we could get ovulation on platform ex vivo, and then we transplanted that back in vivo and using a green fluorescent uh, donor, uh, we were able to show uh, green fluorescent pups that were born. Uh, and so I think this represents the next generation of innovations uh, for tissue regeneration, not just for ovarian function, but for many other tissues where these uh, inks uh, have not been in the past uh, been able to print. Uh, we've been able to develop um, the uh, rules for how um, to uh, maintain integrity for these extracellular matrix matrices. So uh, let me just conclude and say uh, that um, we have now a global oncofertility fertility community, many of whom are practitioners within the room. We now have human eggs, so that we, can, we can demonstrate that this can be accomplished in vitro, and now the next generation of discovery is to improve that process. We have the human zinc spark that's going to allow us to understand the cytoplasmic maturation in the same way we look at nuclear maturation. And we have an ovarian cycle in a dish, a 28-day cycle, which I think can go for at least another month uh, that may allow us to look at repeating uh, cycles over time. And we have the ovarian transplant, the bioprosthetic, that has given us live birth in mice. And so hopefully what I've shown you is that as we're developing these new technologies, we're not just uh, developing new strategies at the bench, but we're actually meeting the urgent unmet need of uh, cancer patients so that the promise of our basic science is the improved care of patients in the future in this transition of what I call bench to bedside to babies. And with that, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come uh, and deliver this lecture. Teresa, don't go. I'd like to thank you for what was a really inspiring and absolutely superb lecture and very, very worthy of the Transatlantic Medal. So I'd like you to invite you to accept the medal.